Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third of five live webinars for Cisco CCNA V3, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of the Information Technology Professionals Association, or ITPA. My name is Guy Coward, and I'll be your MC tonight. And as usual, your mentor is Matt Constable, who you will hear from shortly. Mercifully, I don't have to say much tonight, uh, just talking about football, really. Uh, but before we begin, a word on using Zoom during the webinar. Students have the ability to chat with panelists and amongst yourselves uh, during the webinars and can select who to chat with using the drop down box on the bottom right hand screen when you click on chat. We ask that you direct questions uh, related to course material to the Q&A section uh, and use the chat function for administrative questions and just for general chit chat. But let's push on. Please welcome your mentor for tonight, Matt Constable. Thank you very much, Guy, and uh, welcome everyone to our third session. So this evening, again, is a bit of a bulky one. So we're talking about um, the core subject of the CCNA of routing. So uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've had a look at a couple other core topics, mainly around addressing and switching, and that, that particularly last week was spanning tree. And this one, this week, is again very, very important. So um, bear with me. We've got quite a few slides to get through tonight, and um, I'll try to get through them as quickly as possible. Um, please hold any questions until um, I actually ask for them, if you can. Okay, so let's get started. So routing 101, some real basics of routing. So routing is the process of sending packets from one network to another network, plain and simple. Now notice I'm using the term packet, so that should indicate to you now with the discussions we've had about the OSI model that uh, routing occurs at layer three of the OSI model. That's where packets live. The key term in that statement about routing is network. So it's about routing packets between networks. And in order to do that, routers have to build routing tables or if you like, a map of the networks that they can reach or a network or the networks that they are connected to. And there's a number of different tables that uh, are kept in memory of a router before it comes to the final routing table. And each of the routing protocols is slightly different and we'll have a look at that as we go along. So in order to be able to get packets from one network to another, um, the routers have to have a knowledge of destination networks and their associated subnet masks, as we spoke about in IP addressing the other week. They also need to know what the next hop to each network is. So who do they send, who does router A send the packet to in the next hop in the direction getting to the uh, destination host? And then lastly, they need to have an understanding of the metrics or administrative distances that are involved with that particular route in the routing table. Um, if that doesn't mean much to you, it will by the end of this evening. So a routing table uh, relates or is, has information about two different types of protocols which sound the same two different categories of protocols. And you'll see as we go through tonight that there are a number of different ways of categorizing routing protocols. And you'll notice that one of the topics on the forum this week uh, drills down a little bit into that. And so these are a couple of the answers that you need to refer to in that, in that second forum question, I think it is from memory. So we have what are called routing protocols. So routing protocols are, protocols that dynamically assist the router in building the routing and topology tables, okay? So they're the protocols that the routers use to talk to each other to share information about routes that they know about. And examples of those protocols are EIGRP, OSPF, BGP4, which are the three big ticket, um, three of the big ticket routing protocols you need to understand for CCNA. And there's another, um, RIP version two is the other one that you need to understand. It's also a routing protocol as well. And then we have routed protocols, uh, which are basically uh, a layer three protocol that applies addresses to devices and routes data between the networks. So, or facilitates that transmission of data. Examples of those are simply IPv4, IPv6, IPX is another older one. Apple Talk is another one for those of you that go back a bit. But IPv4 and V6 are the two main ones that you will need to know about for the CCNA. So routing protocols, 
help to build, help the routers to build maps of the networks that are connected to it. Routed protocols are basically used for addressing end hosts or network segments along the way. To decide on the best route to any given destination, a router considers three things in order. It considers prefix length, metric, and administrative distance. And we'll talk about all three of those shortly. So prefix length is the number of bits used to identify the network portion of the destination address and is used to determine the most specific route. The longer the prefix length, the more specific the route. And we've got a, I've got a, um, a picture a little bit later on, a, a diagram a little bit later on that will explain that in more detail. But basically that's to do with the length of your subnet, uh, so your subnet mask. So if, for instance, uh, we spoke about last week, if we look at one of these IP addresses we spoke about last week, so a packet destined for 10.1.5.2 with a slash 24 mask, which is 255.255.255.0. It is more specific, uh, so sorry, so destined for that particular network, it will match more specifically with this route here, so 10.1.5.0 slash 24, than it will to the route 10.0.0.0 slash 8. It's a longer subnet mask, it's a closer match. Okay, so that helps to determine the prefix length or the subnet mask length helps to determine which route we're going to take. We will look at this in a little more detail in some further slides with some diagrams, which will help make it a bit easier to understand. In terms of administrative distance and metric, a metric allows a router to choose the best path within a routing protocol. So what that means is RIP version two, for example, uses the metric of hop count. So with routers, if they're all talking uh, RIP version two, then they will all have the idea of hop count. So that metric of hop count is used within that routing protocol only. Now there are other protocols that use hop count as well, um, and we'll see how they interact later on. But um, metric is usually generally contained within, within a routing protocol. So routes with the best metric within a routing protocol are placed into the routing table. However, there's another component called an administrative distance, which is that third um, component of the decision-making tree that we had a look at just before. And the administrative distance is a measure of how trustworthy a routing protocol is. So that is, it determines who to believe in terms of routes between routing protocols. So in the um, situation where you've got a network which you're running say RIP version two and EIGRP, how does, the, how does a router know which route to believe? Does it believe the EIGRP route or the RIP version two route? Okay, that's not a question I need you to answer. Um, we'll, we'll look at that um, shortly how that's determined. But that's basically the idea of administrative distance is it discriminates between the routes uh, proposed by different routing protocols, whereas metric discriminates between the routes proposed by a single routing protocol. So if we look at the trustworthiness of a routing protocol, so AD, administrative distance, these are the values that are associated with some of the different routing protocols that are available. So a connected route has an administrative distance of zero. So the lower the number, the more trustworthy it is. So in this case, a connected route is the most trusted because it's there, it's physically connected to the router. So the router knows that that route or that destination exists on that network. A static route, because it's put in by an administrator, is assigned an administrative distance of one. And then there's a number of other routing protocols there. So for example, you can see IGRP is more trustworthy than OSPF, which is more trustworthy than RIP, uh, which is more trustworthy than internal BGP, for example. Okay, so the higher the number, um, the less trustworthy it is. What did I say? Sorry, sorry, I've got that. Yeah, that's right, the lower, yeah, lowest metric. I mean, words missed out then. So the lowest metric always wins and therefore results in that particular route being inserted in the routing table. Routes with an administrative distance of unknown, in other words, 255, will never be placed into the routing table. So if the router has no concept of where that's come from, it won't 
insert into the routing table at all. Uh, so I'll just answer that quick question live. No, not all routing uh, protocols use hop count um, and we'll, we'll see the differences as we go along. So the router, what does it do? Effectively, without going into too much detail, this graphic is here for you to have a little bit of a look at um, at a later time. But what does it basically do? It routes packets from one network to another, as we said before. So we've got router one here in the center of the diagram, couple of switches and a couple of end hosts. So anytime PC1 wants to communicate with PC2, that packet, packet for PC2 will have to go past through the switch to router one and then across router one cross switch two to PC2. And it's the router's job to make sure that those packets are translated and transferred between those two different networks. So routers connect networks together and there's always a one-to-one -one relationship between interfaces and subnets. So someone I think asked a question last week um, about the relationship between subnets and interfaces or VLANs and subnets. Um, and even though they're abstracted, like VLANs live at layer two effectively, uh, they need an IP address associated with them. And there's generally not, there is a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, if we remove, there's also the capability to add, um, also the capability to add secondary IP addresses, but they're used for different purposes. But generally we have a one-to-one -one relationship between interfaces and subnets. So as we can see in this particular diagram here, we've got a number of routers that connect these different networks together. And what you can't see in this is the actual uh, relationship between the interfaces and the subnets. But if we drill down say onto this particular router here in the left-hand part of the diagram, we can see that it's got uh, three interfaces in black, which generally means they're Ethernet. So each one of those interfaces could potentially would potentially have a IP address on, and these two, uh, if you like, lightning strike type connections, which are generally serial or some sort of WAN connection, uh, would also have separate IP addresses on them, so separate subnets. We'll look at this as we go through. So routers learn routes via static routes and dynamic routing protocols. That's how they get their route table populated. They then use those routing tables to determine the best path to send packets based on prefix length, metric and administrative distance. Routers also encapsulate the packet and forward out the best interface based on that routing table. Okay, when we talk about encapsulation, that occurs mainly in that, uh, in the scenario. So if we look at this scenario here again, where we have ethernet interfaces on one side, serial interfaces on the other, or some sort of WAN uh, interface on the other. There needs to be a translation of the layer one, layer two packet to convert it from an ethernet packet to a, say an ATM packet or a frame relay packet or a HDLC packet. So that's where the encapsulation part comes in. To determine the best route, the best path is selected by the routing protocol based on the value or metric it uses to determine the distance to reach each network. Now, this can be hop count, it can be cost, it can be a combination of things. So, um, sorry, Matt, I'll just jump in. Um, yep, sure. As per last week, um, we've had a, a couple of people asking if you can use your little laser pointer for the, the device you were talking about. Oh, okay. Time. Yep. Okay, will do. Will do. Thanks. Apologies for that. Um, so, so sometimes the metric is hop count, sometimes it's cost, uh, which is based on a number of different things, which we'll have a look at when we get to OSPF, um, or it can be a combination of uh, multiple things. So if we look at routing, uh, routing information protocol or RIP, it's hop. OSPF uses cost based on the cumulatively, cumul cumulative, I can't even say that, bandwidth from the source to destination. So um, we'll look at an example of later on, but basically it adds up all the bandwidth of all the links between point A and point B, and that is the cost for that particular route. Uh, EIGRP being a Cisco proprietary protocol is a little bit different, what a surprise. Um, it uses a number of things, bandwidth delay, load, reliability, and MTU size, which isn't listed there because it's not generally changed. But in um, general terms, EIGRP will use bandwidth and delay as the two main uh, ways to generate its metric. 
So just quickly here, um, this, this again is, is what I'm talking about before with the encapsulation in the routers. You can see that we've got the LSI model layers there. So the traffic flows down uh, intra stack on PC1, gets past to router two where it does its layer one to three stuff because routers only work at layer three. Yes, they don't have to go any further than that. Sends it across to router two, layer one to three again. Now when router two sends it to router three, because the uh, underlying transmission media is a different type, it's a serial link of some description or a WAN link of some description, it needs to make changes to the layer one and two uh, packet. Whereas that doesn't happen at this particular uh, link here. It's still encapsulated and decapsulated, but nothing changes. Whereas across here, uh, various things change at layer one and two which is a little bit outside the scope of what we're talking about this evening, but we talk a little bit more about that next week. And then lastly, when it gets to PC2, it simply flows back up the OSI model and is uh, delivered to the end client. So just another little uh, representation of how the OSI model and the representation of how important it is. So standing back, it's just a quick example. Um, PC1 needs to see depends at PC2. Uh, PC1 knows, based on the IP address that it's sending to, that PC2 is on a different uh, network. So he encapsulates the packet and sends it to the default gateway on his network. So in other words, uh, we know our end devices have a default gateway, and that's the device that we send our packets to if um, the destination we're sending to does not exist on the same network as we're currently on. So the PC1 sends it to router 2. Um, router two will, uh, sorry, router one. Router one will look into that packet and and look at the destination IP address that it's going to, and then based on its router table, its routing table will then forward it on to wherever it needs to go. In this case, router two. So if we just quickly step through this example, router one looks at the destination IP address, looks in its routing table, sees it's got to send it out fast Ethernet one sees that it's got to send it to the next hop IP of dot two, which is the IP address of router two, encapsulates it appropriately and sends it on. The key thing to understand here is that at all these router points, the source IP, the, the source MAC address changes. So where initially, if we look at the packet before, sorry guys, do you need to say something? Yeah, just with, with the laser, I think people are, Oh, laser pointer. Still looking for lasers, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. sorry, man. Oh, I didn't think it was that hard to see. Sorry, everyone. Um, so if we look at this first frame here, we can see that the source MAC address is the source MAC address of PC1. Now, when it goes to the next, when it goes to the next uh, hop, which is the router, the source MAC address changes to that of the outgoing interface of the router. So all the way along, the destination IP address stays the same. The source IP address stays the same. So that never changes under normal circumstances, okay? We're not talking about NAT here because I'm sure someone will bring up a point about NAT. We're not talking about NAT, we're just talking about pure routing. The source and destination IP addresses don't change, but the source MAC address will change at every hop along the way. So if we go to the next slide, um, maybe the next one after that, we can see, oh no, there we go. So see the next slide here, because we're at router two, router two now has to change the data link part of its frame. Okay, because we're changing from an ethernet to some serial source. And so it then changes the layer two frame. So again, that example of encapsulation changing as we go from technology to technology. Um, when it reaches the destination router or what is the last routed link before it gets to the end host, we then you can see here, it converts back to ethernet. So destination and source MAC address. The IP addresses are still the same. Um, router three can see that uh, the four network, 192.168.4 network is directly connected and knows that it needs to send that packet directly at its fast ethernet zero. Um, interface and away it goes. Once it gets out onto that particular segment of the network, the PC will automatically pick it up because it'll be listening for packets that are destined straight for it. When 
a router, so that, that's if we're talking about routers with a single path. So all through that example, we had a single hop from one uh, router to another. Where there are two or more paths to a destination or two or more ways to go, two or more roads, if you like, with equal cost metrics, so they're exactly the same cost, doesn't matter which way you go, whether it's hop or um, bandwidth cost or bandwidth and delay mixed together, doesn't matter. If they're the same cost metrics, then the router forwards the packets using both of those paths equally. Now, equal cost load balancing can improve network performance. Um, and it can be configured to use both dynamic routing and you can also configure it using static routing. Static routing is a little bit more tricky to manage, uh, but can certainly be done that way. Um, RIP, OSPF and EIGIP support equal cost load balancing. EIGIP also supports unequal cost load balancing. Um, and you can also do that with OSPF and you can also do that with static routing as well. So you can have a particular route that is your primary route, for example, and it might have a cost, say, let's say it's a hop count of five and you send most of your traffic over that. But for some traffic, you might decide I'm going to send it over a slower link or a link with larger hop count because it's not quite so important. It doesn't matter if it gets there a little bit later. So you would either use dynamic uh, unequal load cost balancing in EIGRP or you might do it with static routes to uh, route your traffic based on that. So a perfect example of that might be um, you may have a uh, a satellite site, so you may have a main head office with a satellite site connected via a high-speed WAN link and you transfer business traffic over that high-speed WAN link. However, any internet surfing traffic, you might say, right, we'll send it out the local slower ADSL uh, internet access internet access path rather than send it across the high-speed link back to the head office and then out their internet link. Okay, just as an example of what, when you might use that. So administrative distance, as we said before, is just an updated slide, a little bit different on that, but um, we've sort of spoken about that. Static route with an AD of one is more reliable than EIGRP, with an AD of 90, as we can see here, directly connect the route zero more um, than one. So that's a reiteration of what we've already spoken about to consolidate it for you. Uh, the routing table, so the routing table, once it's uh, populated and ready to go, stored in RAM, so in volatile memory, um, and it stores all the information it has about directly connected routes, remote routes that are coming in via dynamic routing protocols or that are put in by static routes, and network or next hop association. So that is, where do I send packets destined for, route, uh, for network A on the next hop? Who do I send it to? Who's going to be my next man? So, show IP route is a command that you're going to use quite a lot of in your networking career. Um, and when you use show IP route, you'll see local route interfaces. So they're added to the routing table when an interface is configured. So anytime you configure an interface on the router, whether it's physical or logical, uh, it will be displayed in the routing table as a local route interface. And we'll have a look at an example of that in a minute. Directly um, connected interfaces are added to the routing table when an interface is configured and active. Okay, so you can configure an interface and have it in a down state, won't show on the routing table. When you bring it up into an up state, it will then show on the routing table. And then your static routes. So they're routes that you add in with the IP route command, manually configured, um, and they will uh, show in the routing table um, at all times. And then lastly, dynamic, route, dynamic routes, which are added um, when something like ELJP, OSPF, RIP, BGP, ISIS, whatever the protocol is you're using, um, they're implemented and then uh, neighboring routers talk to each other and they share that routing information and that begins to populate the uh, routing table. So if we look at our, this routing table, um, so this is a show IP route from router one. And we're looking at this particular this particular route's uh, something uh, not necessarily highlighted, but you'll see there's quite a bit of code 
um, quite a bit of explanatory code up here, which just talks about the different things that can um, then appear in a routing table. And there's some more examples later on, which are probably better and give a little bit more expansive detail. But we can see this one down here. A couple of key things that I want to draw your attention to. One is this statement here, which says gateway of last resort is not set. So that basically means that there's no default route set. The gateway of last resort is a default route. So the route that you put in when you type in, if statically you would type in IP route 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0, 0.0.0.0, next hop address. That's the gateway of last resort. So that's basically the network that the router will send packets to if it has no idea where to send a route. Um, and then secondly, this line down here, now we can see it's got a D at the start here. If we look in our table here, that then signifies that it's an EIGRP route. So we can see that this route is configured with dynamic routing using EIGRP. And through EIGRP, it has learnt the route to the network 10.1.1.0 slash 24, so 24 bit subnet mask. Um, these two numbers here, uh, respectively, the first number before the slash is 90, that's the administrative distance, so the trustworthiness of EIGRP. This second large ridiculous looking number is the metric, so that's the OSPF metric, which in normal circumstances, if you don't tweak it, is a combination of the bandwidth and delay of that particular interface. And then this IP address here is the next hop, so it's telling us that to get to the 10.1.1 dot zero slash 24 network, we need to send our packets to 209.165.200.226, which is router two. So network remote entries, okay, there we go. So that's basically explaining what I've just said. How the, how the route was learnt, destination network, administrative distance, metric, next hop, uh, that one's the amount of time since the network was last discovered. And this is the outgoing interface, uh, which should always match up with the next hop. So if the next, so for instance, if the next hop is not available at that interface, there's something seriously wrong. Uh, so this is just an IPv6 route table, just for a bit of uh, completeness and a little bit more confusion around IPv6. So we can see here we've got C, which is a connected route. So that means that that particular network is connected directly to gigabit zero slash zero. So that's talking about this network up here. And then we have one that's marked L. So if we look at L, L is local route. Okay, and we can see that that's connected. Uh, that's been learned through uh, gigabit zero zero. All right, static routing. So let's click through these points. Okay, so static routes and default static routes can be implemented after directly connected interfaces are adding to the router table. So in other words, once an interface has come up, you can use that interface to send a static route out. Static routes are always manually configured. They define a very explicit route between two networking devices. Uh, they have to be, the thing to keep in mind about them is that they have to be manually updated if the topology changes. So if you move the network or an interface is changed and the network that you're routing to is connected to a different interface, then you have to change that route manually. It can't be done automatically as it would with dynamic routing. The benefits of them are, are improved security and control resources. The reason it's improved security is because the routes are statically put in, assuming the administrator knows what they're doing and they put in the correct route. Um, there's less likelihood of things going wrong than there is with a routing protocol. There's also less likelihood of a rogue router being inserted into the network and um, updating the network uh, table. So default static route, as I said before, is used when the routing table has no other idea about where the destination network lies. Um, and you use that particular command there, as I was talking about before, to um, configure a static route. So IP route, all zeros, all zeros. So the first lot of zeros indicates that it's just any network. The second set of zeros is basically the wildcard mark, which determines basically that saying, I don't care where the packet's going from. If I don't know where it's going from, I'm going to send it out either this interface 
or the next hop IP address. So you can actually send it to out an interface rather than going to a next hop IP. And you may want to do that in the case where you've got a dial on demand interface. So where you've got a dial on demand interface like an ISDN or a DSL or something, and you don't necessarily know what the next hop address is, you just send the packets out that interface. It's completely valid to do that as well. And there's just an example of a static route. The thing that you'll notice is in the route table, uh, so we put the route in, thus, and in this case is to send out the serial interface. And um, we can see now that when we do a show IP route, we've got the gateway of last resort is now set. And the static route now appears in the routing table with a star. Now, the significance of the star is that's just saying that's the default route. In this case, it's the only one, so it has to be. Dynamic routing on the other hand. So that, I mean, that's basically it for static routing. Pretty straightforward. If you want to put a route into a network, you just type it in manually, away it goes. Easy as that. Dynamic routing is just using routing protocols configured on each router to automatically distribute routes that each router knows, um, knows about to each other so that they've both got a consistent view of the network. So in this case, router one knows about a couple of networks he sends that information to router two. Router two knows about a couple of networks and he sends that information to router one. And now all of a sudden, both of them have the same um, picture of what the overall network looks like. All routes are connected, all routes are in the routing table. Everyone can talk to everyone and everyone's happy. So from an IPv4 perspective, there are three routing protocols that you really need to um, know about, three internal routing protocols you need to know about. Uh, so there's EIGRP, Enhanced Interior Gateway Routing Protocol, which is a Cisco proprietary protocol, still reasonably widely used. Um, OSPF or Open Shortest Path First is probably the most common uh, one that you'll see. Certainly if you work in a provider space, you'll see a lot of OSPF uh, and RIP, uh, Routing Information Protocol. Now, just something I want to note. The open part of open shortest path first doesn't literally mean open this path. It just means that it's an open protocol. Okay, so it's a standards based protocol, not proprietary um, as EIGRP is. In terms of IPv6, um, we have a number. Whoops, sorry, gone back, gone too far. Sorry. Um, RIP next generation. So RIP NG specifically is for IPv6. OSPF version three specifically for IPv6, EIGRP for IPv6, I think that says it all, uh, and um, multi, multicast protocol border gateway protocol. So BGP basically for IPv6. You will also need to know a little bit about BGP for IPv4. And we talk a little bit about that next week when we talk about WAN. So why would we use dynamic routing? Um, mainly to discover remote networks automatically to maintain up-to-date routing information so we don't have to do it statically, we don't have to make any changes when network changes, the routing routers will work that out themselves. They will uh, give you that information and update it. Choosing the best path to destination networks, well that's argue, that's you know that's that that's a bit of a moot point because you can also do that with static routing. It's just easier to manage in a dynamic routing um, in a dynamic routing world. And as routes change and as interfaces go up and down, routing change tables will change much more quickly. And then that last point, just what I'm alluding to, provides you with the ability to find a new best path if the current path suddenly becomes no longer available, whether that's via a fault or a disconnection or whatever the case may be. So basic components and theories around routing, um, routing protocols. I think the main thing that I want you to get out of this, this is an example using EIGRP. Um, you'll see EIGRP has a number of different um, packet types that it uses to talk between routers to ensure that routing updates are transferred securely. And we don't really need to go into too much detail on that. But I think the main thing I want you to get out of this particular graphic is that there is a neighbor table and a topology table. Now this is the same, this is one of the similarities between EIGRP and OSPF as well. They create a neighbor table, which is basically a table containing all the directly connected routers that are also speaking EIGRP, for example, or OSPF. Okay, so it's just neighbors speaking the same language. 
The topology table is a complete picture of every single route that the routers, whether they're talking EIGRP or OSPF, that all the routers know about. Uh, this could include duplicates to certain networks. So it's all the routes they know about. So this isn't a routing table, this is the topology table. So this is an absolute complete picture of all the different ways to get to all the different networks. They may include the best route, well they will include the best route, but they may also include four or five other routes of the same network that you can also use to get to if your main route goes down. So that's in the topology table. And then from that, the routers will grab the best route for every destination network and populate that into the final routing table. So in both those cases of OSPF and EIGRP, we have a neighbor table, a topology table, and then the final routing table. Um, so advantages of dynamic routing, we've already covered this a little bit. Share information about remote networks automatically, determine the best path, add this information to routing tables. Compared to static routing, dynamic routing protocols require less administrative overhead because you don't have to sit there and type them. Um, so they help you to maintain the network quickly and with much less effort. The disadvantages of those, of course, are that part of the router's resources are dedicated to actually maintaining the routing protocol itself. So the communication between the routers to ensure the routing table is up to date. And this obviously has an impact on processor, processor time, memory, um, and also your network link bandwidth. But in most high speed environments, it's negligible. Um, can, can be, look, it can be a problem in some environments, but if the network is scaled appropriately, it should, shouldn't ever really be an issue. Um, but there are times when static routing may be more appropriate. Again, it's like any network engineering question. The answer is, what are you going to use? How are you going to configure it? Well, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Would, would now be a decent time for quick Q&A? Yeah, we can do a quick Q&A. Okay, so there's not that many questions there. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll let you go through them. And, and all right, we'll do. Well. So I'll answer them all live. So key concepts one should have in mind when configuring VLANs. Um, so that was something we really talked about last week. I don't want to dwell on that too much. Um, but basically uh, from this week's, if, if you can think of a VLAN as being analogous to a subnet, so the same advantages that you have with subnetting applies to VLANs as well. But the, the, the primary concept um, and, and um, benefit of using VLANs is to cut down those broadcast domains. Uh, so can we define metric value manually or routers do it automatically? Depends, you can, you can uh, um, define a metric value manually, absolutely. Um, when you do static routing, you can actually change um, the metric to a network. Uh, in terms of dynamic routing protocols, you can change the metrics in a dynamic routing protocol. So for instance, with OSPF, you can up the cost of specific interfaces. Um, but generally, I would advise against doing that. Let the routing protocol work it out itself. But certainly, if you're going to CCIE level, you'll be put in situations where you will have to know how to do that. But that's obviously a long way down the track. Um, routing protocols, not all of them have hop count. No, I think we've covered that one. Um, why is the source MAC address not important in the transfer of data? Uh, the source MAC address is important. Um, so I'm not sure why you're asking that question, but the source MAC address will change at each routed hop. Uh, and the reason it does that is because as it comes back, it has to be able to match up the correct MAC address at layer two. So the, 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 the MAC addresses at layer two are very distinct from the um, addresses at layer three. So when we're talking about going across an ethernet link or an ATM link or a frame relay link, those layer two addresses must be substituted um, so that the source address appears as it actually come from the uh, next hop router. Whereas the IP address doesn't have to change because um, if all routers have a complete view of the network, they will know how to get from one network to another. So those IP addresses can still stay the same, but the MAC address must change. If it doesn't, then you'll get communication issues. Uh, so considering AD for RIP, OSPF and EOGP, okay, hang on a sec. 
if you've configured your network with RIP only or ISPF only or EOGP only, the data would travel faster and the network's configured with a lower administrative distance or is it just a reference? No, if you're only using a single protocol, the administrative distance is irrelevant. Um, that, that doesn't matter at all. It only comes into effect when you're using multiple protocols. So you'll say using RIP and OSPF in the same network. And then in, in that case, it would always take, the routing table would um, take the route with the lowest administrative distance, hence the route that it learned from the routing protocol with the lowest AD. Uh, setting the same metric on the static route by default, create load balancing between the routes. Um, if you have multiple static routes with the same metric, yes, exactly. Uh, so connected route and local route. So a connected, a connected route is a route that's connected to that interface. A local route is one that's configured on that router, but not necessarily on a connected interface. Uh, how many hops does the table keep? Uh, we'll get to that. That's a good question, but there are limits to the number of hops that each routing program has. Is there a switch router combined device? There is, it's called a layer three switch. Uh, you can manage more than one routing table for, yes, you can. A two ISP, absolutely, you can, you can do as many. Uh, well, it's a single routing table, but you can have multiple routes. So it's not, not two routing tables unless you're using something like MPLS, which then will have a separate routing table for um, each MPLS VLAN. Is ARP table and router the original MAC address of the source? Not quite sure what that one's driving at. Alrighty, we might get someone to send in some confirmation or clarification for that one and we'll yeah, push on yeah. for now. Yeah, I think, yeah, there's a couple more questions coming in, but I think um, they're, they're going to be answered up shortly. Thanks, folks. Okay, so summarised operations dynamic routing as follows. Router sends and receives routing messages on its interfaces. Router shares the routing messages and routing information with other routers that are using the same routing protocol. So if you've got two routers back to back, one using OSPF, one using EIGRP, they won't exchange routes, has to be the same routing protocol. Um, routers exchange routing information to learn about remote networks. So that one's pretty straightforward. And then when a router detects the topology change, the routing protocol will then advertise that change to all its known uh, neighbors. So convergence is basically the time it takes for the uh, network topology and routing tables to get to a balanced state. So in other words, when you click on, if you've got a network, say with five routers and you turn them all on and you configure OSPF on them all, and they're all starting to come up, they will take a time before they all know, uh, or they have a, a complete picture of all the different routes and all the different information across that entire network. And that time to achieve that is known as the time to convergence. Um, so a network is not, the thing to remember is that it does, A, it takes time for that to happen. Not a lot of time, but it does take time. So when there are changes, that picture has to change, that those changes take time to propagate. The network is not completely operational until that network has completely converged. So the properties around convergence um, include, are related to the speed of propagation of the routing information and the calculation of the optimal path. So that can be limited by uh, protocol, by uh, iOS version, by hardware platform, by memory, processing speed, all that sort of stuff. And generally, older protocols like RIP are much slower than to converge compared to EIGOP and OSPF as an example. Now, some of that is based on the fact that it's an older um, technology. Part of it is also based, it's a different type of routing protocol, which we'll have a look at shortly. So if we look at, as we were talking about before, um, the different classifications of routing protocols. So we have our dynamic routing protocols over the top. We then have what's called interior gateway protocols and exterior gateway protocols. So interior gateway protocols basically just mean routing protocols we use um, internally within networks. So within an enterprise or within a small, uh, within a confined network space. EGPs are basically used externally. 
really the only B, the only EGP we really talk about now is BGP, Water Gateway Protocol. In terms of interior gateway protocols, we have distance vector routing protocols and we have link state protocols. And again, we'll have a look at those in a minute. Now this diagram is a little bit not quite right um, in that link state protocols are definitely OSPF and ISIS. OSPF, mainly what we're gonna look at. Distance vector protocols, RIP one and two, definitely distance vector. IGRP, EIGRP, little bit of a foot in both camps. So little bit distance vector, little sort of bit link state. Um, and the reason I say that is because they maintain that topology table and um, an idea of all connected links. It's not just about hop count. So there's other things involved in that as well. So IGP versus EGP. So interior gateway protocols, as I said, used for routing within an autonomous system. So if we look at this one, autonomous system one is EIGRP and we've got ISIS here. We've got OSPF here, we've got RIP over here, we've got OSPF here. Whereas the exterior gateway protocols are used to, con to communicate between autonomous systems. So you can see all these autonomous systems, even though they run their own interior gateway protocol, they also have um, access available between them through using border gateway protocol as exterior gateway protocol. Um, we can also use static routes to do that because we can always use static routes. Okay, the big, the big picture, distance vector or link state. Basically distance vector protocols use routers as signposts along the path to a final destination. So each router represents a hop. A link state protocol, however, is like having a complete map of the topology. So whereas with distance vector, you just go from intersection to intersection or road sign to road sign to get to your destination. A link state with a link state, protocol, it's like having a map in front of you. So you already know, you can already see where your destination is. You just have to work out the best path to get to it. So distance vector protocols in the IGP space. So we're talking IGPs here, interior gateways. There's RIP version one, RIP version two, and you begrudgingly I'll say IGRP and EIGRP, even though they do have a foot in both camps. Um, but basically we're saying that they use hop as the vector, as the distance. So hop is a distance. So how far are we going? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hops. Um, with rip, the maximum number of hops you can go to is 15. Okay, so once a packet has gone through 15 hops, doesn't care anymore, just dies, gets dropped. Okay, that's in a network that is completely uh, using rip. So you can't have a rip network any larger than 15 hops, otherwise packets will start to get lost. So the hop is how is the distance? How far are we going to go? The vector is the direction in which that packet needs to go. So in this case, um, to get to 172.16.3.0 slash 24 from router one, we have one hop, that's the distance, with the vector being towards router two. So out zero, 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 zero. That's where they get the distance vector from. How far, which direction? Link state routing protocols, on the other hand, build up a uh, topology or do build up an idea of all the links that they know about. So each router here, router one, two, three, and four, in its own link state database will build up knowledge of all the links it has access to. So router two's got three links, router one, uh, router four's got one, router one's got two, router three's got one, or two, sorry, there's a link update from router one there. Um, so each one builds up that knowledge of all the links that it knows about and all the links that its neighbors know about. So they share this information around. So it's a link state routing protocol. These are the state, let's so say router one would look at the status of its links. So it's got one link that's down, one link that's up. That's up. It would send that information on to router two who would then subsequently send that on to three and four. Okay, so they've, got, they've all got the same idea of the state of the links right across the network. So that's where they get the link state from. It's all about whether the links are up or down. 
And yet another way you can classify routing protocols, just to make it more confusing, is you can call them classful or classless. So classful routing protocols don't send subnet mask information in the routing updates, okay? So basically they work on default subnet mask length. If we go back to RFC 1918 or to any sort of subnet, when we went back and looked at our IP addressing in week one, we could see that class A networks, so between 1.0.0.0 and 126.255.255.255, that's a class A network. So by default, that would use a slash eight subnet mask. So in a classful routing protocol like RIP version one or IGRP, they don't send subnet mask information. So there's no such thing as variable length subnet masking or classless interdomain routing. It doesn't know anything about it. It just does it based on subnet on default subnet masks. And this can create problems in what are called discontiguous networks. So that's where you say you've got, uh, if you're using say the 10 address range on, you've got a three router network, a router in the middle, two routers either side, and then on either side of routers one and three, you have the 10 network. Okay, they're both using the same network number, but they're split by another routing, a router in the middle. So they're discontiguous, they're not connected together. Classful routing protocols play havoc with that sort of environment. Classless routing protocols, however, do send subnet information in the routing updates. So RIP version two, EIGRP, OSPF, ISIS, and of course BGP. This then means that they'll support variable length subnet masking. So you can use a slash 24, you can use a slash 23, you can use a slash eight, a slash 16 subnet mask. Doesn't matter, will still work. Um, also capable of doing classless interdomain routing, which all that really is, is um, being able to route between different uh, autonomous systems using subnet masking. Um, and also supports IPv6 routing protocols. So uh, there are no classful IPv6 routing protocols. So if we look at the characteristics, this is just a summary table that I'll let you look at in your own time, but basically it gives you a rundown of distance vector link state, speed of convergence, scalability, whether it uses VLSM, resource usage and implementation and maintenance. Okay, but I'll let you look at that in your own time. Um, routing protocol metrics, okay, metric measurable variable that is assigned to the routing protocol to different routes based on the usefulness of that route. So it could be uh, used to determine the overall cost of a path from source to destination. Um, and this is what the routing protocols use to determine what's the best route to put in to the table. So if you look at distance vector technologies, these guys, distance vector routing protocols, so RIP version one and two, IGRP, EIGRP, if they want to, if we want to talk about it that way, share updates between neighbors. They're not aware of the network topology though. They're just aware of the routes that they know about and their neighbors know about, but they don't know whether links are up and down or what the actual shape of the network looks like. They'll send periodic updates to a broadcast IP address generally, although some of those protocols use their own multicast addresses to do that, EIGRP um, in, in particular. Um, but they'll send out those updates. RIP, for instance, will send out updates even if the topology hasn't changed. So every 30 seconds, RIP will send out an update even if nothing's changed, which obviously consumes bandwidth and CPU resources primarily. RIP version two and EIGRP, as I said, will use multicast addresses. So it's not broadcast, um, they're specific multicast addresses that you are tuned to. Um, and the other good thing about EIGRP is it will only send an update when a topology, when the topology is changed or a link goes up and down. Whereas RIP will send it out all the time. So RIP version one versus RIP version two, um, you can see there's some pretty big differences there. The only real similarity is that they both use the simple metric of hop count and that the limit is 15. But other than that, as you can see, they're quite different. So some important points for you to know uh, for your CCNA exam, uh, particularly the multicast address for RIP version two and the differences, okay? That it can support VLSM, CIDR, supports summarization because it sends subnet um, information in the updates and supports the ability to authenticate. So it's not quite so easy to um, put
put in a rogue router and a root version 2 network if it's configured to use authentication. So it doesn't use it by default, but you can configure it. Now, auto summarization. Similarly to RIP version one, RIP version two uh, will automatically summarize networks at major network boundaries by default. So even though it sends subnet information with its updates, it will still summarize at the major network boundaries. So that means it'll summarize all uh, class A addresses with a slash eight, class B with a slash 16, class C with a slash 24. Um, which means of course then that you, you, you lose some of that uh, granularity with your subnets and your VLSM. So your variable length subnet masking. To modify that behavior, all you need to do is issue the command no auto summary. And once you do that, then it will send the complete subnet mask with every update for every network. Um, RIP version one, that command doesn't do anything because it doesn't care. It's class, it's classful, it doesn't care, it's not gonna send it anyway. And as I just said, once it's disabled, root version two won't automatically summarize on those classless band, class boundaries. So if we look at EIGRP just quickly, uh, the differences between IGRP and EGRP, so fairly similar to root version one, root version two, yeah? So they both use a composite metric consisting of bandwidth and delay, um, reliability, load, and MTU can also be added into the metric calculation, but generally you don't worry about it. It's far too complex to even worry about trying to um, edit the K values. Um, as a rule, just leave it at defaults. And you can see EIGRP uses the next multicast address up from version two, um, and again, has the similar differences between uh, IGRP and EIGRP as there is between RIP version one and version two. Um, when we're talking about variable length subnet masking and sending subnet information, subnet mask information. So next, let's state routing protocols, but we're actually only gonna talk about the one. I'm only gonna talk about OSPF. It's the main one you need to get your head around and there's a lot to know about it. Basically link state uh, routing protocols, each router learns about the directly connected networks. Each router then sends hellos to directly connected neighbors to say, I'm here, I've got some information. Each router then sends out link state packets containing the state of all directly connected links to all its neighbors. So this way it shares the status of all its links with all its friends. So it builds up, they all build up a map of where networks are attached. Link state advantages. Each router builds its own topology table. It's responsible for its own topology table. Um, immediate flood of link state packets, so faster convergence. So as soon as anything changes, update is flooded out in all directions. So bang, happens straight away. Um, link state packets are only sent when a change occurs, so it doesn't broadcast, it just sends them out. Only sends, um, and it only sends the change. So it'll only send the link state update for the link that has changed. It won't send anything else because we already know the status of the other links. and there are hierarchical design, which we'll have a look about at in more detail in uh, a second. Disadvantages, not too many as you can see. So additional memory, additional CPU cycles for the SPF algorithm and link slate flooding can cause bandwidth issues. In my experience, I would say none of those are really applicable in a um, adequately scaled network. So OSPF basics turning to a link state protocol. It is a link state, it's an open standard, therefore implemented by many vendors. It only supports IP, so no IPX if for those of you who are still living in old Novell land. It uses cost as a metric, which is based on the speed of the interfaces. And it used what's called a Dijkstra SPF algorithm to determine the best route. And there's just an example of the Dijkstra algorithm there. So again, you can look at that in your own time, but basically it's just showing the shortest path for a host on router two to reach router three. Okay, so it could potentially go this way or it could go this way. Clearly going this way is a shorter path. That's the path the algorithm's going to pick. I'll let you um, mull over that and digest that a little bit on your own. So OSPF, getting into the real nuts and bolts. It's a hierarchical design that uses of the construct of an area. It forms neighbor relationships with directly connected or adjacent routers in the same area. It advertises the status of its directly connected links. 
updates are called link state advertisements and it will only send changes outside of the periodic 30 minute refresh. So every 30 minutes it will send a periodic update of everything, but in between times it will only send changes. So you can imagine it um, drastically reduces the amount of bandwidth that's used, the resources that are used. It uses multicast addresses to communicate. Great. So broadcasts, don't, don't worry about it. It's great. So 224.0.0.5 is used to multicast information to all OSPF routers, whereas dot six is used to only communicate between designated routers. And we'll see what a designated router is shortly. It is classless and supports VLSM and obviously CIDR. It has an administrative distance of 110 or a trustworthiness of 110. And as I said before earlier, it builds three tables, a neighbor, a topology, and a routing table. Important you understand that. And important that you also understand that's the same for EIGRP. So a lot of this stuff in OSPF is equally applicable to EIGRP. Um, the difference being obviously the multicast address that uh, EIGRP uses. It only uses one, so it uses dot 10. So neighbors. Okay, OSPF forms what is called an adjacency with a neighbor. And it does this by exchanging hello packets to the dot five address. Only after an adjacency is formed, so after they agree that they'll talk to each other, can routes be shared, can the link states be shared. Each router is identified by a unique router ID, has to be unique. It can be manually specified, but it can also be generated automatically. Now, if it is generated automatically, if you just leave it to its own devices, it, the router ID will be, will be sourced from the highest numerical IP on any loopback interface that the router has. So the highest numerical loopback interface IP will be used first. If you don't have a loopback address, and you may not have, it will just use the highest numerical IP on any, interface, any other interface. Now it says physical interface, but it can also be VLAN interface as well in that layer three switching environment. So hello packets, as we said, are sent out every 10 seconds for broadcast or point to point interfaces. These are important points for you to know for the CCNA exam. So hello packets sent out 10 seconds for broadcast or point to point interfaces. And we'll see what that means shortly. 30 seconds for non-broadcast multi-access or point to multi-point interfaces. So that means if you've got single router connected via a single interface to lots of other, um, lots of other uh, routers via non-broadcast methods, so that might be frame relay, for example, updates are sent every 30 seconds. If it's a broadcast interface, like say an ethernet, or it's a point to point link, just a back to back cable, then it'll be every 10 seconds. There is a concept of a dead interval. So the dead interval basically just says, and it's basically just four times the hello interval for each of those different types of networks, say 40 and 120 seconds respectively. All that basically says is, if I don't hear from my neighbor in this amount of time, I will consider it to be dead and gone. This can be adjusted, set, set manually, but very, uh, very seldom would you actually need to do that. To form a full neighbor relationship for a full adjacency to come up and therefore for routes to start flowing between routers, the following parameters within the hello packet must match on both sides of the link on both to, for both routers that are communicating. For every pair of routers that communicate to each other, all of these particular things must match. So the area ID, part of the hierarchy, the area type, the prefix, the subnet mask, so the network prefix, the subnet mask, the hello and dead interval timers, the network type, so whether it's an NBMA, point to multi-point, point to point broadcast, and authentication parameters if used. If any one of those does not match, an adjacency will not be formed and routes will not flow between those routers. The hello packets are then basically used as a keep alive and allow the status of all neighbors to be known relatively quickly within those dead interval timers. Um, and then they, that information in those hello packets is then, then used to build the routing table, uh, the neighbor table, sorry, the routing table, the neighbor table. Um, 
and the neighbor table contains a routing ID of each that unique routing ID of each neighbor, the current state of each neighbor, so whether it's alive or dead, the interface that is directly connected to that neighbor, and the IP address on the other end, so the IP address of the remote interface on that neighbor. Okay, which can be different to different to the routing ID, but it could be the same as well. Okay, so a designated router. What is a designated router? I'm glad you asked. In a multiple access network, so that is a network where there are multiple routers accessing it, there can be many neighbors requiring n to the n minus one divided by two links for a full mesh network to to be formed. So basically that just means if we have a bucket load of routers all talking to each other and they've got a link to every other router, it becomes a big messed up mesh of links, either logical or physical. Now this of course could potentially create a lot of link state advertisement traffic if links are going up and down. So in order to stop this from happening, OSPF uses this concept of a designated router or a, and a backup designated router. And basically there's an election process which the OSPF routers go through to determine the designated and backup designated routers. Um, generally determined by priority, router ID and the priority, but the priority can be manually set. Um, and the idea is that the designated router will become the authoritative uh, source of information for that particular network. Uh, the de backup designated router, of course, becomes a second in command. So if the designated router goes offline, the backup designated router then takes that information on board. So if there are any changes in the network, um, the non-designated router routers will send their updates to the designated router and it will be responsible for distributing that um, those link state advertisements outbound. So neighbor adjacencies, um, going back to, to establishing our neighbor states, will pass through various states. So there's the down state, the init state, two-way, X start, exchange, loading, and full. These are all relatively important for your exam, the, 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 the CCNA exam, the official CCNA exam, not, not the MOOC exam, um, because you'll quite possibly get questions which will show uh, the command show IP OSPF neighbor and some of these may be written on them and you will have to determine which state uh, the neighbor relationship is in based on this particular, based on which one of these words is actually present. So if a neighbor is in a down state, basically means I haven't heard from that neighbor, I don't know who he is, I've, I've got no information on it, so it's down. The init state means that I've received a hello packet, but as yet I haven't received two-way communication. So I either haven't sent my hello packet or it hasn't been acknowledged. Two-way state means that we've each seen each other's hellos um, and the designated, uh, but we haven't gone any further. And it's at this stage that the DR and the BDRs are elected. Okay, so once we get to this two-way start, that's when this election process kicks off to determine who becomes numero uno. X start is where the neighbors are preparing to share information. So that's exchange start. So we're getting ready, we've seen each other, we know each other exists, we're getting ready to start to exchange our routes. We then go into the exchange phase where routers will actually start to share their database descriptors, which is just a fancy term meaning links routes that, that each one knows about, starts to share them backwards and forwards. Loading, they're exchanging their routes more fully. So all the information is coming across. And then lastly, the full state is when neighbors are fully synchronized. So once we reach the full state, everything's up and running, the network topology is stable and we're good to go. Um, so the full state also has some substates. So there's the full DR, full BDR and full druther. So these are just indicative of who's who in the zoo, who the boss is. So full DR indicates that the router is a designated router. Full BDR indicates the neighbor is a backup designated router. And the full druther means that it's neither a designated router or a backup designated router, but it's just a router. It's another router that's involved in OSPF, but it's not a linchpin. It's not a kingpin in the environment. Um, on multi-access networks, OSPF will only form full adjacencies with DR and BDR routers. So what that basically means is that you will get, um, you will see all the OSPF when you look at the neighbor table on a, on a non 
DR or BDR router, you will see all the other OSPF routers, but they will all be in a two-way state. Okay, that is normal. It often freaks people out, but that's that's normal. When you look at the OSPF neighbor table, it's completely normal in a multi-access network to see full relationships only with the DR and BDR and everything else is in a two-way state. Completely normal. Don't panic, it's okay. So network types. Um, as we're talking about, that's one of the metrics, one of the components of the adjacency that has to match. So there's broadcast multi-access. So broadcast traffic occurs. So examples are Ethernet, ATM, token ring, <laughs> for those of you who want to go back that far. OSPF will elect the designator and BDR in broadcast multi-access environments and uses multicast traffic to those two addresses, as we said earlier. And in this case, there's no need to manually configure neighbors because they'll work it out themselves. If we look at point-to-point -point, um, networks, this is where routers are basically directly connected, either through an ISP cloud or direct direct. So uh, this could also be, Ethernet could also sort of fit into this category as well, but not generally. Uh, but we're looking at ISDN and ATM as a couple of examples. So in this case, OSPF doesn't have to elect a designated or BDR because it's just a single link. Um, all traffic uses that single multicast address so not to DR, BDR, doesn't use that address because they don't exist. And again, there's no need to manually configure neighbors. Uh, the routing protocol is clever enough to work it out itself. Point to multipoint, one interface connects to multiple routers. So point to multipoint frame relay is a perfect example of this. OSPF will not elect DRs or BDRs in this case either. Uh, all traffic to that single address because obviously BDRs, DRs don't exist. No need to manually configure neighbors again, it will work them out uh, on its own. And then lastly, non-broadcast multi-access. So in this case, we've got multiple access, we've got lots of different routers potentially accessing, but there's no broadcast traffic at all. Um, so one interface connects to multiple routers, but broadcast cannot be sent. So frame relay is, a, is an example of this. Um, in this case, the OSBF has to elect a DR, BDR. Um, because there's multiple access, there's multiple routers out there, you've got to have a boss. But in this case, because there's no broadcast and hence no multicast traffic, you have to manually configure the neighbors yourself because the OSPF traffic can only be sent over unicast, multicast not permitted in a non-broadcast environment. So in this case, this is the only case where you actually have to configure the neighbors. So in terms of OSPF hierarchy, as we said, OSPF is hierarchical, makes use of the construct of an area. So therefore, OSPF traffic can be intra-area, so within a single area. It can be inter-area, so between areas, or it can be completely external, which means it's going from, generally means it's going from OSPF to some other routing protocol, whether that be EIGRP, RIP, BGP, just to a different domain, whatever. OSPF routers will build a topology database of all the links within their specified area. And all OSPF routers within an area will have the same idea of what the topology look like, looks like. Um, and routing updates will only contain information about links that are local to each individual area. So if you have a network with multiple areas, there will be two topology tables. So if we look at this here, we have very good diagram here. So we have multiple area OSPF. We have area zero, which is known as the backbone area. You have to have area zero, it's mandatory. Consider the backbone or transit area. All other areas must have a connection to area zero, okay? That because that's the backbone area. There is a slight exception to this where you can use virtual links, but that's not generally the norm. So you can see here that area one touches area zero by going through router one. Area two touches area zero by going through router two, same as area three touches area zero going through router three. You'll notice that these routers have got ABR written on them. That stands for Autonomous Border Router. And we'll have a look at what that means in a minute. But basically any router that sits, oh, sorry, not autonomous, area border router. So um, any router that is touching two areas will be an area border router because it's the border of multiple areas. Okay, so backbone, so this router here is not a border router, it's just a router. This router here, just a router. 
this router here, just a router, just a router. So they're just an OSPF router. But these three guys here are area border routers because they touch on multiple areas. So OSPF areas can clearly belong to multiple areas because we've just seen that. And in that case, they will maintain a separate topology database for each area that they're connected to. And they then become known as that area border router, as I said. If, however, one of the areas is external to OSPF, so that means if it's EIGRP or BGP, or it's just connecting to the internet or to RIP version two, then that router is also known as an autonomous system border or autonomous system boundary router. So it's the boundary of your autonomous system or your OSPF system. So as I've explained, ASBRs, autonomous system border routers, provide access to internet or other routing protocol domains like EIJP, um, ISIS, root version two, root version one, so on. Now, in terms of routes that come from those external areas through autonomous system boundary routers, there are two types of external routes that OSPF uh, considers that you need to understand. There is a type one route known as E1. Now this route is a little different in that it includes the external cost, so the cost that's coming from outside the boundary, outside of the autonomous system, so it could be coming from EIGRP or RIP version two or ISIS, and the internal cost to reach that autonomous system boundary router. So all the internal links, the cost of all the internal links to get to that boundary router, plus the external cost to get from the boundary router to the destination host or the destination network is what makes up the cost for the type one route. Type one routes are always preferred over type two routes to the same destination. So type one, preferred over type two. Type one includes external cost, internal cost as well. A type two route only includes the external cost to the destination network. That's it. So you can see why the type one is preferred over type two, because it is more complete. It has more information. It knows more about the route to the destination network. So type two on external cost, type one internal plus external cost, better picture of what's going on, I'm going to believe type one first. Um, so type two routes are the default type assigned to any route that comes into the network externally. So whether that's coming in via redistribution from EIGRP or RIP or coming in statically, whatever the case may be, that's assigned as a type two route. And as we've seen, um, we've already seen a couple of these, we've seen three of them actually, there are four types of OSPF routers. So there's, well actually we've seen all of them. So there's an internal router, in which case all interfaces belong to a single area. So that was those routers we looked at before that were just existing only in the single area. An area border router contains interfaces in at least two different areas. So it can have multiple different areas, but at least two. The backbone router, must any, back, any router is a backbone router if it contains at least one interface in area zero. So those routers before that were area border routers can also be considered backbone routers because they also have an interface in area zero. And then an autonomous system boundary or border router have to have a connection to the external autonomous system. Okay, so they can also be, they can also be considered an area border router as well because they could have um, interfaces in multiple multiple OSPF areas and an external autonomous system at the same time. So it can get quite complex. Now, the link state advertisements are basically the way in which OSPF will keep track of all the statuses of the links and how they forward updates. Um, and this information from these link state advertisements are what makes up that topological database. And there are several types. Um, not all of which you have to really know that much about, but I provide them for uh, reference to you. So there's a router LSA, which is type one, a network LSA type two, a network summary, which is a type three, an ASBR summary type four, an external type five. And they all come from different areas. So router LSA uh, one and two, type one and two, and three to a degree, basically come from within the OSPF autonomous system. 
uh, a summary LSA and external LSAs often come from routers that are connected or do come from routers that are connected to external systems or, are, or routes that are coming in from uh, external areas. So one, two and three, basically internal, four and five external. So each type of LSA, irrespective of whether it's one, two, three or five, is sent at three, uh, under three different sets of circumstances. So firstly, when adjacencies are formed, so when that neighbor relationship comes up, LSAs are sent. So the topology database can be built. Everyone knows what's going on. Routing table can then be built. When a change in the topology occurs, so a link goes up and down, primarily it's a link state protocol. So when links go up and down, occurs then. And when a link state advertisement reaches its maximum age, so 30 minutes. If we remember back a few slides ago, every 30 minutes we send a refresh update. So they're the three times when LSAs are sent. Um, refresh updates every 30 minutes, okay. So the metric for OSPF is a cost based on the speed of an interface. So the lower the cost, the more preferred a route is. Cost can be set manually. My question to you is, why would you need to do that? Think very carefully about it before you do that. Um, and these are some typical Cisco OSPF cost values. So OSPF costs as they apply in a Cisco environment. Um, so you can see that 56k link, if you've still got them, I feel sorry for you, but if you have, uh, then obviously that's a much higher cost than a fast Ethernet or faster. So really anything over fast Ethernet or faster is uh, allocated the same cost, which is a little bit ridiculous, um, given that the, the speed difference between fast Ethernet and gigabit or 10 gigabit is obviously quite substantial, but um, it's going to come down to your design, whether you're using a three core, the, the level of architecture you're using and, and obviously comes down to you as the administrator to ensure that your routing is um, configured intelligently. But again, probably a discussion for a high level of Cisco certification. So to basically configure OSPF, we turn it on like this. We get to a router console, we get into config mode and we type router OSPF1 or router OSPF number. That number can be any value between one and 65535, memory serves me correctly. And it's just an ID. It's just a process number. Uh, you can run multiple instances of OSPF on some versions of iOS. Um, question is why you would want to do that. Um, I don't know, uh, but generally that's just a, a process ID. And then these next two statements, so the network statements associate OSPF or enable, if you like, OSPF on any network or any interface that has a network address that corresponds to that network. So what's this, what this is basically saying is any interface with a starting with an IP address that starts with 10.4 or 10.2 will now be uh, configured to use OSPF in area zero. So that's what that's saying. The interesting thing that I want to draw your attention to, because it will come up on uh, different exams that you will see, is passive interface default. So the passive interface default command, what that basically does, is that says, by default, I don't want any interface to be involved with OSPF. So I want them to be passive. Hence, passive interface is now the default. So that means that if you issue that command, um, when you enter these network statements, even if there are interfaces on your router which do match those network statements, they won't send OSPF updates out. They won't be involved in OSPF because by default, all interfaces are passive. So in order to enable uh, interfaces that exist in those networks to work, we use the no passive interface E0. So in this case, we're saying, I do want OSPF to be initiated on the net zero interface. Now, why would you use that instead of just network statements? Let's say, for instance, you've got a router with 100 different interfaces on it. And every one of those interfaces, or 50 of those in this example, 50 of those interfaces are configured with a 10.4 network, so a 10.4 dot something subnet, and the other 50 are a 10.2 dot something subnet. Now you don't want to necessarily enable OSPF on all those interfaces. You only want to enable OSPF on the interfaces that are going to connect to other OSPF routers. So in this case, we're saying 
okay, they're the network statements, they're the interfaces that we want to be enabled, but we're only going to enable the Ethernet Zero interface. Now, something that also is tricky that a lot of people mistake is that they think that this network statement means that we are going to um, send out information about the 10.4 network in our OSPF updates. That's not what that statement says. That statement merely says any interface that has an IP address that matches 10.4.something.something, .something, .something, I want to participate in OSPF routing and I want that interface to be in area zero. That's all it says. So these statements actually set up each interface to participate in OSPF routing. The information that is sent out via OSPF is then determined by the status of the links. Because remember, it's a link state protocol. Okay, it's a link state protocol. So be very careful that you understand that, that this isn't saying what networks we want to be broadcast or multicast for OSPF. It's telling us what interfaces we want to participate in OSPF. Very, uh, very big difference. So um, virtual links, as I was saying before, are the way to connect routers that for some reason don't touch area zero. So it provides a transit link into area zero, if you like. So if we look at this example here, we have area zero over here. So this router would be a backbone router and an area border router. This router here is just a, an area router, so standard router. And this router over here is also an area border router because he's got links into area two and area one, but he goes against that rule of OSPF in that it doesn't access, it doesn't touch area zero. So this guy at the moment is creating an issue within our OSPF hierarchy and there would be routing issues across this domain. Now, a virtual link allows this router here to transit area one and have a logical link or a virtual link to area zero, thus um, removing that violation of the all routers must touch area zero rule in OSPF. This is useful in this circumstance, but it's also useful if you've got two area zeros. So for instance, you've got um, in area two, you might have another router touching here, which is then touching another area zero over here. So it's useful to be able to connect those two area zeros. They might not be the same area zero in that they're different organizations, but you connect them together and they become the same, uh, the same network. So it's a way of, it's another way of, if you like, um, getting through that migration process of two companies that have joined together, both got OSPF, both got area zeros, joining them together via this sort of um, extra net area, if you like. So that's another example of when you might use it. So if we just briefly go back to the routing table, um, I said earlier on that we would have some examples of the routing table just to look at. And we can see this one here, there's a number of different types of routes now that appear in here. So we've got some connected routes, We've got some locally known routes. We've got some R's, which stands for RIP. Unfortunately, the rest of it's off there, but you can see it. There's a gateway of last resort. Let's start to break that down a little bit. So if we look at a, um, an entry in a routing table, this graphic here, similar to the one we saw earlier, um, gives a breakdown of what is uh, each component of the route of that route entry is. So I've got a route source. In this case, it's RIP, the destination network, the um, that's actually incorrect. That's not the administrative distance. That's actually the subnet mask. So that's interesting. Um, this here is the metric. So the 120 there is the administrative distance of RIP. And this is the hop count. So we've got administrative distance and hop count. Just keep in mind that that arrow there should be administrative distance should be pointing to the 120. Okay, Paul, I'm not sure why that graphic's like that, but that's that's incorrect, so please take note of that. So 120 is administrative distance, two is the metric. Next hop, the router we have to, the IP address we have to send it to. This is how long we've known about this route for. So it's under the 30 seconds, so we're all good. Um, and the outgoing interface, that's the interface that we're gonna go out to get to that particular route. So as we said before, just to reiterate, we're getting to the end of the slide. So now it's time to do a little bit of revision. Best route, longest match. 
So if we look at this IP packet destination, we want to go to 172.16.0.10. Okay, so that's that in binary. That's what it looks like in binary. We have three routes available. We have 172.16 slash 12, 172.16 slash 18, 172.16 slash 26. If we look at all of those in binary, so we consider how many bits, so the shaded part is how many bits we are considering, how many bits we are considering when we match the destination packet to the route. Okay, so in this count, case we're using the first 12, in this we're using the first 18, in this we're using the first 26. We can see that this route here, 26 bit, is the longest match. So that then is the best route, that's the most definitive route, the one we trust the most. So we're going to send it out via that route three, wherever that may point to. So if we look at IPv6 quickly, um, routing table entries, basically the same as IPv4, look very similar. IPv6 is classless, of course, by design, so that's why I said there's no classful IPv6 routing protocols. Um, all routes are effectively level one ultimate, what are called level one ultimate routes. There is no level one parent or level two child routes. It's just all routes are basically ultimate routes. Um, and if we look at an entry for uh, IPv6, basically the same structure as an IPv4. Okay, so we've got D, the route source, D, EIGRP, the network destination and subnet mask, the administrative distance, so 90 for EIGRP, it's another way we know it's EIGRP. The metric, that's another way we know it's EIGRP because it's got a funny metric. This is via, so that's the next hop, the next hop IP address, and then the interface which that will go out. So it's exactly the same components as an IPv4 um, route table entry. Just quickly, into VLAN routing. Now I want to briefly, I, I sort of added this in during the week because of some questions from last week. So into VLAN routing, as we spoke about last week, in order to be able to communicate between VLANs, we have to have a layer three device or router. So in this case, if this router didn't exist and we had VLAN 10 and VLAN 30, then anything on VLAN 30 could communicate to each other Anything on VLAN 10 can communicate to each other, but not between the VLANs. In order to do that, we need a router. So in legacy into VLAN routing, or the old way that we used to do it, actually uh, actual routers were used to route between VLANs. Each VLAN was connected to a different physical router interface. So if we look at this diagram, we have two physical interfaces for two VLANs. Okay, not very scalable. Packets would arrive on the router through one interface and be routed out the other interface. So if we look at this diagram again, VLAN 30 wants to talk to VLAN 10, we go up this way to the router and then out this way to VLAN 10. Okay, pretty straightforward. Same sort of thing as we've looked at most of the evening. Because the router interfaces are connected to VLANs and had IP addresses from that specific VLAN, routing between those VLANs was then achieved, okay? doesn't scale very well. So the larger your network gets, the more difficult that becomes because you have to have lots and lots of different physical interfaces. That's the old way of doing it. We can also do what's called router on a stick. So the router on a stick basically means we use one interface on the router and we configure, as we spoke about last week, 802.1Q trunk ports so that the router can understand the VLAN tags that come in. So if you remember from last week, dot one Q will append a, uh, will, will put insert a VLAN tag on each packet as it goes across the trunk. These router ports basically become trunk ports like interswitch links. And they use those VLAN tags to determine which of the sub interfaces um, the traffic will go across. So for when you create a router uh, interface as a trunk port, each of the VLANs will have associated with it what's called a sub interface on that router, on that router interface. Um, the VLAN members or hosts are configured to use a sub interface address as a default gateway. So each VLAN has a sub interface, that sub interface will have an individual IP address that is part of that IP subnet associated with that VLAN. And then the other hosts on that VLAN, on each particular VLAN will then use that IP address as their default gateway. And in this case, only one of the router's physical interfaces is used, so it uses a lot less uh, physical real estate. We then have our multi-layer inter-VLAN routing. 
And basically all that is, is that's taking it from router on a stick where you use a physical interface and that's taking it to a layer three switching domain where you use virtual interfaces, so these VLAN interfaces. So some of you will have seen on uh, layer three devices, layer three switching devices, you will have VLAN interfaces. So they're not a physical interface, they're what's called a switched virtual interface or an SVI. They're just a VLAN interface with an associated IP address, but they're still uh, counted as a routed router interface. And they're used to also route between VLANs. So we're just, they're just different abstractions. All these three models are just different abstractions of the same thing. So we have multiple physical interfaces, one physical interface using trunking, then lots of different logical interfaces. So it's almost like you're going back to the old days where you had lots of physical interfaces, but now instead of having physical ones, you're having virtual interfaces inside the memory um, of your layer three device. Okay, so that's it, we got through. Just a little bit over time, which is great. So next week, we're gonna look at WAN technologies, a little bit of QAS and some infrastructure services, so mainly around DNS, DHCP, and a little bit of NAT as well. So um, I'm sure there are some questions. So I'll look through and just scan through and see any of these questions that haven't been answered. So, but if you want to send any more through, by all means, feel free to. So what have we got? How do you configure a VLAN to a simple network using a Cisco gateway? I think that's what this is. So I think what you're saying there is, so you need to create a VLAN for a start, like we did last week um, in a layer two construct. Um, so again, if you're not sure how to create the VLANs, have a look at the packet tracer layers because they will guide you through all this that we're talking about. So we're talking about the theory, use those for the practical. Um, so basically you need to then create an, a VLAN interface. So that's simply interface VLAN, whatever, whatever the VLAN number is. So VLAN 20, for example, that then creates that interface and you can use that as you would any other Cisco, any Cisco uh, physical interface, for example. So it's just exactly the same. Uh, oh, okay, there's a few coming through, so to scroll. When it is appropriate to use OSPF RIP or EIGRP? Uh, look, that's, uh, that's a, a depends question. Depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you have a small network, maybe only five or six or seven or you know, up to about 10 or 12 routers, maybe at most, you might use RIP. The thing to remember about RIP is because it has limited hop count, it's got limited diameter for how far your network can go. Um, OSPF and EIGRP are better for larger scale networks because they're faster and they have uh, greater control over metric um, and they can also have a larger diameter. OSPF uh, is probably the, the, the protocol you would use in most circumstances, in particular if you're going to connect to other autonomous systems, but um, there's a concept, and I, and I don't talk about it in, in this MOOC because it's really more of a CCNP thing. There's a concept called redistribution where you can use multiple different routing protocols. So you could use all three of those and just share routes between them. But that, as I said, that's um, a construct for a higher certification. Uh, so it's, it's a difficult question to answer. It's a good question, but it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, does it have a method of sharing routing info from one routing protocol to another? It does indeed, and that's that's uh, called redistribution. So um, that's it's not really it's not a Cisco um, or iOS construct. It's related to any routing vendor, and it's just um, it's a re reasonably straightforward configuration uh, to be able to share that information between two routing protocols. A complex part of it is. Um, understanding the way in which the metrics change between protocols. So say OSPF, for example, which uses bandwidth as its, so the bandwidth of its interfaces as its cost. EIGOP uses bandwidth and delay. So there's a disconnect there. You're not comparing apples with apples. So when you redistribute OSPF into EIGOP, for example, then the tricky part is getting your head around the metrics and how to tailor them for your network. So good question. Um, what protocols used to communicate Cisco IP phone VLAN to IP phone? Okay, that's a little bit left of center, but the answer to that is CDP. CDP uses that, does that. So Cisco Discovery Protocol. Um, again, a discussion for another time. 
Can loops be created while routers are trying to converge? Uh, they can, depending on the routing protocol, most noticeably in RIP, uh, that can definitely happen. Um, that can happen when, uh, and generally happens in RIP when the, dynamo, the diameter of your network is such that it takes uh, greater than 30 seconds for the route, um, routes to propagate right across. Um, it can also happen um, in other routing protocols, link state routing protocols, but much less common because of their speed and because of the way they send updates. They don't broadcast everything, they just send link states. A good question. Uh, I have the router identify the destination Mac. Okay, that's related to the earlier question, okay. Um, AS, AS means autonomous system. So that's just, that just means um, a single system or single OSPF system. So even if your OSPF, uh, you have multiple areas in your OSPF system, it's still a single autonomous system. So it's a system of routing protocol or network that stands alone by itself. Uh, any benefits to class less routing? Absolutely, you can use variable length subnet masking. Simple as that, that's uh, the biggest benefit, the most obvious one. So you can use subnetting uh, to its ultimate effect, whereas in class, um, class full uh, routing, you cannot. Oh, okay, I see, yeah, yes, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> the next question I should look at that. So class full networking, um, not particularly, uh, unless you've got a very small diameter network. So it's just uh, simpler, less overhead, but um, in anything relatively large, now you would always go uh, classless. Uh, Source-based routing. Um, Source-based routing is not really related to routing protocol. That's more, it's more something that, as you said, you would use with firewalls or you can do, um, you can do statically. Um, or using a thing called policy routing as well. You can also do source-based routing using policy routing, but it's not generally something that routing, um, dynamic routing protocols will do. Um, they're all about destination routing. Uh, highest IP, uh, by highest IP, what I was talking about there is the highest numerical IP. So for instance, if we look at two IP addresses, 10.1.1.1 and 192.168.1.1, then 192, uh, is the 192 address is numerically higher because its first octet is a higher number. So that's all that, that basically means. Uh, so the OSPF area, good question. What defines an OSPF area? Um, it's not necessarily a VLAN or a subnet. It is, um, it's a separate construct. So you can, you could basically have, if you wanted to, you could have all your um, OSPF routers in a single area and if all of your OSPF areas are in a single area, all your subnets or your VLANs are also in a single area. So it's not related to VLANs and subnets, it's an administrative, um, it's an administrative construct that you as an administrator define what an area is. You, you decide how far that area goes. So it could contain all your routers, it may only contain a backbone area, with each of your subnet areas, potentially, as we saw in the diagram earlier, might be in a different area. Um, and again, that it, it's more related to a design question of what are you trying to achieve with your network. If you're trying to create some sort of uh, route summarization, or so, so for instance, if you have an area zero and you have other areas in area one, two, and three, where those uh, joining routers are, so those area border routers that connect area zero with area one, area two, and area three, they will summarize those routes. Okay, so that means that in area zero, your routing table is a little less complex than it may otherwise be. Um, but it, in answer to your question, what defines an OSPF area? You as an administrator um, really define that. Uh, Ooh, difficult to see when they're coming in. Is the remaining uh, LSA time viewable in the Cisco OS, uh, iOS? Uh, yes, it is. If you look at the uh, neighbor table and the topology table, so that would be show IP OSPF neighbor, and it will give you a, um, a time of uh, when it last heard from each neighbor. Ooh, that one I'm not sure what you're getting at. OSPF update neighbor states 
an interface state with designated border designated what if point to point route well I'm not sure what you're driving out there if you clarify that that'd be good um, why is there hex display when pinging IPv6 because uh, well they're all they're all hex IP addresses so that's why you'll see hex are VLAN same as DHCP pools on the router they can be but they don't have to be so uh, they're not they're not linked inextricably they're linked by you as a administrator but they're not they don't have to be linked are these protocols used in data centers um, yeah data centers yes I've worked for service providers that do use OSPF um, not so much EIGRP or RIP v2 uh, most of the time they live in enterprise land but OSPF certainly um, ISIS intermediate system to intermediate system which we didn't talk about not covered so much in depth on the exam um, is certainly one that's used by uh, service providers um, and BGP is obviously uh, the main routing protocol of the internet but when we're talking about connecting customers so as a service provider yes you provide internet but you also provide potentially MPLS VPNs and other uh, WAN, uh, WAN services for your um, customers uh, quite often OSPF um, and EIGOP can be used in those circumstances as well so yeah data centers could have any or all of them really how to verify that the network is converged with OSPF. If you look at your OSPF neighbor table, so show IP OSPF neighbor, you will see the states of all your neighbors. If you've got, if all of them are in a full state, you know that it's fully converged. Uh, would you use a BVI and add multiple VLAN interfaces to the bridge group, then apply ACL to the BVI? Uh, that's a little bit out of scope and probably one that we'll look at in the last week when we talk about that. So I might, I might hand that, I might hang that over because that'll probably be answered in the last week. Uh, is it necessary to apply passive interface by default? No, no, you don't have to. You don't have to apply that. It depends a little bit on your version of iOS. Some will apply it by default. It'll be on by default. Others it won't be, and you'll have to actually put it on. So, but again, it depends on what, how big your network is, how many interfaces you've got, how many of them you want to uh, be members of OSPF. Okay, manual priorities. No. Okay, so. Um, Automatic, no, no. So I think what you're getting at there is, no, you can't um, change the priorities in a dynamic routing table. You can tweak some of the metrics um, by manually putting metrics on specific interfaces, but uh, dynamically, a, a dynamic routing protocol routing table is what it is. When to choose EIGRP versus OSPF? Uh, that's a very long winded question for another, again, depends on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, depends on whether you're integrating with um, other vendor routers. So if you're an entire Cisco shop, you might well go with EIGRP and that's fine. If uh, you're Cisco, Hewlett Packard, you know, you've got other different vendors in there, OSPF would be a better way to go because they, uh, it's more widely supported. Um, could be dependent on your provider as well, your service provider might like you to run OSPF, they might not support EIGRP. So again, it's a bit of a depends question. Okay, loopback interfaces, that's a brilliant question, one I really like. Um, the benefit of a loopback interface is it never goes down. So if you've got a router ID uh, tied to a physical interface and that physical interface goes down, your router ID disappears as well. Because as we said before, the router ID is the highest numerical um, interface. If you haven't got a loopback interface, it goes to the physical interface, the highest IP on a physical interface. So if that physical interface, that is your router ID goes down, you lose your router ID as well. So the router ID will change, which then triggers a whole lot of other changes in OSPF. If you use a loopback interface, loopback interfaces are just a logical interface that sit in memory, they never go down. Configure the IP address on that, configure router ID to use that loopback interface, it'll never go down, your ID never changes. So irrespective of what your physical interfaces are doing, uh, your router ID won't change and therefore there's not that catastrophic change within your OSPF architecture. Can you have multiple OSPF areas, same OSPF areas in a single network? Uh, not generally a good idea. So no, I mean you can, but it won't work very well. So you shouldn't have, I think what you're saying is there multiple area zeros, multiple area ones, multiple area twos. No, no, not a good idea. 
Uh, DR BDR election is done between neighbour routers. Basically, it's based on the router ID first and a priority that um, is either automatically set at a default or you can set it. So you can, same, it's very similar to spanning tree process last week, same sort of process, uses a priority, highest priority um, is the winner. And therefore I would advise you to manually set those priorities as you want so that you can control your um, designated router and backup designated router. Uh, Policy-based routing, yeah, we haven't talked about that. Um, that's something uh, we might talk about that a little bit next week uh, and potentially the week after, but policy-based routing um, is not really dynamic routing. It's more to do with static routing and you determining using a um, using access lists basically to classify routes that you want to head in a certain direction. So you could certainly do that um, in terms of your load balancing. We were talking about before doing that with static routes. You could certainly use policy routing to do that as well. So, um, so use policy to say, all right, we'll send uh, our SQL traffic, for instance, over our fast WAN link and our and our mail server traffic. Um, you know, our, our outbound email traffic over our slower internet-based link. So absolutely, and that's what policy routing is based uh, based around your ability to determine where your traffic's going to go um, above and beyond what dynamic routing protocols can do. Can IRS support both transcoding and conferencing at the same time? That's a real, uh, that's a totally different question for another time. So um, I think I might leave that one. Uh, software defined networks and software routers, anything to watch out for? Similar concepts. So it, with respect to what we're talking about, um, the concepts are no different absolutely no different. So there's there's other conversations that can be had certainly around those, but in terms of what we've been talking about um, in our routing uh, discussion, uh, no different. And I think, Guy, that's it. Yeah, fantastic job, Matt. Thanks so much for answering all those questions and no, thanks everyone right. for sending them all in. Um, as Matt said, there's, there's quite a few good ones in there. Um, yeah, other than that, thanks for hanging around, gang. Um, hope you had a, got a lot out of that one. Next week, what are we what are we chatting about again? Sorry, Matt. Uh, so next week we are looking at uh, some WAN technologies, a little bit about quads, and then some infrastructure services. So basically, setting up your routers to work with DNS um, from a local perspective, uh, DHCP. So to forward DHCP requests from hosts to uh, either provide the DHCP services themselves or forward it on to servers. Um, because we understand that DHCP is a broadcast based thing. Routers usually stop that. Uh, and then to look at some uh, HSRP and GLBP, which are protocols which allow routers to um, basically provide standby to each other. So uh, active passive type uh, situation for router failover. Fantastic. All right, hope you're all looking forward to that. Thanks again for hanging out and coming and keeping us company. We'll see you all next week. And thank you very much, Matt. Uh, no worries at all. Thank you, Guy, for your work as well. And thank everyone for your attendance. I understand it's a little bit longer. Uh, the next couple of weeks should be uh, much closer to the air and the half as we get towards the end of the course. So thank you for hanging around.